More than 100 Americans are dying from it every single day. It's become one of the country's deadliest crises. With opiates, once they sink their teeth in you, there's no going back. The opioid problem in America is an epidemic. So can anything be done to stop it? And we'll be looking at what has become a sad fact of life here in the United States, gun violence. Mass shootings continue to occur with frightening regularity. Heartland, Florida, Thousand Oaks, California, and Pittsburgh, Pennsylvania, just to name a few. The left has lobbied hard, but legislation hasn't changed much. Now, one group is taking a different approach to try and stop the problem. We'll be talking to the people at the heart of these issues here in New York. The Square starts now. Welcome to Times Square. I'm Anijan Ayanar. On this show, we'll be talking about issues that matter to people here in New York and across the country. And we want you to get involved. So send us your questions and comments to our Twitter and Facebook sites at TRT World and tell us what you think. Let's start with a problem that is killing more than 50,000 Americans every year. That's the opioid epidemic here. Right now, the U.S. has the highest figure of drug-related deaths in the world. Millions of people are affected, and there's no demographic that has not been touched by it. Here's the story of two people who've suffered from the grips of opioids and are struggling every day. My name is George Jones, and I'm a recovering addict forever till the day I leave this earth. The people that I associated with were into substance abuse. So a lot of times, association brings on the simulation. And um, un unfortunately, um, it was a terrible choice. My family has always been a close-knit family, very supportive, but I was more so ashamed and embarrassed, so I stayed away. I really didn't want them to know exactly what was going on until I really decided to, you know, seek help. But then, by then, it, it was too, it was too late. I was, you know, I, I had been, you know, substance abuse like 35, 40 years. It feels like your insides are just being twisted and just, you know, all a disarray. And that feeling is so uncomfortable uncomfortable and I just got tired of taking myself through that same feeling over and over and over and like <clears throat> this isn't this isn't how I want my life to be you know because the only thing that comes along with that is either jail or the cemetery and um, I knew that I had more to offer to this world My name is AJ Diaz and I am a recovering addict and alcoholic. My sophomore year of college, I had a roommate that I lived with who um, dealt opiates um, and, uh, and that's how it started. Um, I was curious, um, I was kind of looking for the next thing to elevate how I partied on the weekend. I played sports my whole life. I went to college to go play two sports um, and I ended up quitting both of those sports. Two, thing, you know, two sports that were a central theme in my life, my entire life. Um, purely so that I can, could drink and do drugs. Um, you know, opiates had taken center stage in my life uh, and anything that got in the way of that, you know, had to fall by the wayside. And with opiates, once they sink their teeth in you, there's no going back. Um, you know, it completely changes who you are. It makes you do things that you never normally do. And it becomes your sole obsession. I was a kid who kind of had every box checked. I was going to go to college, I was going to get an education, I was going to play sports in college, I had friends, um, I, had, uh, I have had and have a perfect family, and I nearly threw all of that away for opiates. There is absolutely nothing cool about that. All right, let's bring in our guests to talk more about this. With me are Sam Arsenal. She manages the Substance Use Treatment Task Force for Shatterproof. That's an organization that helps people with addictions. Jeff Coots is a professor at John Jay College of Criminal Justice. And Dr. Michelle Soto. She is the Vice President of Medical Services for START, 
a drug treatment and recovery clinic. Welcome to all of you to The Square. Michelle, you work directly with addicts, people like uh, George and AJ that we just saw. Is it fair to say to put them all into one category? No, it's not. Um, I think people get into addiction for different reasons, and you really have to individualize that treatment that you offer. The treatment is not simply the medications. It's really the counseling that goes hand in hand with that medication, um, because all the patients that come through our doors have a different reason to have started the substance abuse. Sam, Michelle just said people get into addiction. Is this a choice or is it, is it a disease? This is absolutely a disease. So, you know, there's obviously an element of choice in taking your first substance, but as I'm sure we'll talk about, um, many people take substances for the first time because they're prescribed by a physician for routine medical care, um, or, you know, they're experimenting as an adolescent, um, but the addiction itself is a chronic relapsing disease. Jeff, I want to get your thoughts on how we actually got here in terms of some of the key factors why we're actually experiencing such a deep uh, health crisis in this country. Well, the CDC put out a report a couple years back that highlighted that we saw a big expansion of our prescription opioids uh, beginning in the early 2000s, and the overdose rates related to prescription opioids uh, increased from then on through about 13 and then leveled off. Uh, and then one of the things we saw was people were switching to heroin. As we recognized that the prescription drugs were causing problems, we contracted the availability of those drugs and people switched to heroin. We saw an increase there. And then in more recent years, we've seen fentanyl come onto the market and, and so really seen a big spike uh, in fentanyl-related overdoses since about 2014. Is there one particular sort of best way in terms of treating this? I think it has to be a multifaceted approach. So, you know, we have to prevent new substance use disorders, encourage opioid stewardship in the medical field, as well as expanding access to effective treatments like medication-assisted treatment for opioid use disorder, um, reforming the criminal justice system and making sure treatment's available throughout all of these different areas. An argument can be made there. You're actually using another drug to substitute this type of... Um... Yeah, you would never make that argument when you were talking about treating diabetes using insulin, right? Yes, the person is dependent on insulin, just like someone who's being treated with medication-assisted treatment is dependent on the drug, but that's different from being addicted. All right, let's pause there for just a minute and turn to a case that has re-highlighted the depth of the opioid crisis in America. The Sackler family owns a major pharmaceutical company in the United States, and they've been accused of profiting from the country's opioid crisis. Let's hear why. For a long time, New York's Metropolitan Museum of Art has benefited from the generosity of the Sackler family. The same is true for the Louvre, British Museum and Guggenheim. The Sacklers even have their own wing. It was at this museum in March last year that protesters littered the gallery with empty prescription bottles. The Sackler family owns Purdue Pharma that produced the opioid painkiller OxyContin. The protesters believe it's this product that has significantly contributed to the country's opioid crisis, something the family strongly denies. According to the Centers for Disease Control and Prevention, nearly 400,000 people died from opioid overdoses between 1999 and 2017. We're now talking about tens of thousands of deaths that now can be measured in people per hour who are dropping dead because of this. It means that we're facing a crisis that we've never seen before. The Massachusetts Attorney General accuses Purdue Pharma of profiting from the opioid epidemic through what she calls a deceptive sales campaign. The lawsuit accuses a Sackler family member of telling the company to make the sale of high-dosed painkillers a priority. And the suit claims that the family knew of the addiction risks. Nine Purdue board members and eight members of the Sackler family are implicated. Arthur Sackler bought Purdue Pharma in 1952 and died before OxyContin was invented in 1996. New court documents suggest family members made over $4 billion between 2008 and 2016, and Forbes estimate the Sacklers are worth $13 billion. In 2007, Purdue pled guilty in federal court to not properly informing the public about OxyContin's addictive properties. A spokesperson at Purdue says no family member is currently on the board. And in a statement, the company says the lawsuit is riddled with demonstrably inaccurate allegations and part of a continuing effort to single out Purdue, blame it for the entire opioid crisis and try the case in the court of public opinion rather than the justice system. The opioid crisis is impacting communities across America. 
and Massachusetts is one of 36 states seeking legal action against Purdue. So that's the situation. Uh, Michelle Soto, do doctors have a tendency to overprescribe uh, medication? I think, unfortunately, we do. Um, we have patients coming in complaining that they have pain. We may not have a very um, objective way of measuring that pain level, and we really want to address the patient. We want to make sure that we get them comfortable. I think we have a responsibility to make sure that we're, we're reassessing that patient regularly so we're not over-prescribing um, to decide when is the time to really cut back on the prescribing. Um, last year, there were 191 million prescriptions for opioids dispensed at pharmacy. So that is a high number. It's alarming. Jeff, let me turn to you. Just um, This is an ongoing case with the Sackler investigation, but what sort of implications could this have I think this case spawned from a desire to blame somebody, right? It's not just the corporate form that they want to hold responsible because they pled guilty a few years back, as they said, but the family that started that company or that sat on the board of that. Uh, there may be some gains that the states are able to claw back some financial gains from the company and from the family and use that to support their own expansion of treatment services, which I think could be a benefit from it. But pain is part of the human condition. And if we are helping people to cope with the challenges of their daily lives in a healthy way, we're, we're better off for it. Who do you think is to blame for this then? I think we all are accountable for how our medical system operates. I think it was a well-intentioned development where doctors wanted to respond to the pain that, was, uh, that they saw increasing in their patients. And then OxyContin came along and we were led to believe, uh, and, and there was messaging out there, that it was less addictive than other opioids. And I think, uh, you know, that was likely a, a, a poor judgment on thousands of doctors across the country thinking that this was a safer option than Vicodin, thinking that we could solve these underlying pain issues and emotional challenges that folks face with a pill. And now we've transitioned into synthetics like fentanyl. And, and how much more dangerous is this? Well, the fentanyl is about 50 to 100 times more potent than the morphine is. Unfortunately, it's being made illicitly and we don't really know how important that one is compared to the pharmaceutical grade. So we, we really don't have a full understanding. And is this sort of like a gateway into other things as well? Well, I think it's important to recognize that we have an opioid crisis at hand because opioids are driving the overdose death rate. Um, but we really have an addiction and substance use crisis. 90,000 Americans are still dying of alcohol-related deaths every year. Um, you know, we're having a lot of polysubstance overdoses, so there's a lethal combination of opioids and benzodiazepines that's driving a lot of opioid overdose deaths, and, you know, an uptick in stimulant use as well. And so I think when we think about addressing this crisis, we really need to think about a holistic approach to drug use and addiction over Overall versus just focusing our efforts solely on opioids or we'll, we'll be blinded by the next thing that comes at us. Dr. Michelle Soto, Jeff, Sam, thank you for coming on and actually uh, educating our, uh, not only myself but also our viewers as well. Thank you very thank much. You. Thank you for having us. Let's turn now to gun control. It's something we've talked a lot about in recent months. 2018 was the worst in recorded history for gun attacks in U.S. schools. The media has been riddled with stories of gun crime, and we saw hundreds of thousands of people march in Washington to call for stricter gun control laws. Wherever you stand on the issue, numbers and statistics don't lie. There are more gun dealers in America than McDonald's restaurants. In fact, four times as many. More than 30,000 people are killed by guns every year. After major gun shootings, sales increase, as do the stock price of manufacturers. Here's more. The time has come to do something about it. 70% of the American people in every poll that's done want these weapons out of the schools and off the streets. The data tells you that America has a gun violence rate that is 20 times that of every other industrialized country in the world. But we don't have a higher mental illness rate. Our schools aren't less safe. It's because the quickest way to stop a bad guy with a gun is a good guy with a gun.
rather than trying to ban specific weapons, what we ought to do is ban specific people from having any weapon. You can buy a handgun. You can't buy one, but you have to wait till you're 21. But you can buy the kind of weapon used in the school shooting at 18. What do we want? When do we want? This morning, we also completed the process to issue a new regulation banning bump stocks. Nothing is more important than protecting our nation's children. Well, I want to get the perspective of two young people. Here with me in the studio are two students who attend college here in New York, Emily Gagne and Samantha Singh. Thanks for coming here on The Square. Let me start with you. What do you think is the most shocking statistics uh, for you? Um for me, I would say the most shocking gun statistics would actually be the amount of suicides that happen uh, at the hand of guns. I mean, I think it's easy to look at a couple of uh, outliers in these gun debates as, you know, mass shootings and people who are taking really drastic it's measures. It's actually a very small portion of the total killings that the mass yeah, shootings are. Yeah, absolutely. And I think that by inflicting better gun control, we can actually help a lot more people than we even realize. Uh, we just heard there in the piece... Um, U.S. Vice President Mike Pence say the only way to stop a bad person is, to, is, is a good person with a gun. Your thoughts on that? I think that adding more dangerous weapons to the mix, especially in schools, is antithetical to, the, to solving the issue. You want legislative change. What's one th bill that you would pass? Definitely just making it more difficult for people who are not fit to carry or have access to weapons um, just making them unable to get weapons. Just more screening, for sure, because there are a lot of people who are legally getting guns who are not fit to be handling them because of their mental capacities. With the gun lobby in this country so strong, do you think that's even possible? I mean, I think that it's unrealistic to think that we could get rid of guns that are in the public completely. I mean, guns are something that, like we saw in the video, there are so many out there. and. I think the biggest issue is tackling automatic and semi-automatic guns, weapons that are going to kill a lot of people really quickly, weapons that are really dangerous, and also just making sure that people are licensed and have gone through screening processes, but have also gone through training in order to get those. Mm -hmm. Have you ever felt unsafe when you were at school? Yes, actually, um, in my high school, we thought it was a drill at the time. It ended up not being a drill. There was a threat on campus. They said that there was a person who may be armed. Luckily, it turned out to be um, a false alarm. In a sense, there was a suspicious person, but they were unarmed and didn't do any harm. But we were locked down for a few hours. How did that make you feel? Um, I was very scared, actually. I was under a desk, and I didn't know at the time what was going on. I learned through Twitter that it wasn't a drill. And then um, we had to wait in our class all day, disrupted our curriculum. It was terrifying, really, in, at the moment. Terrifying. So, Emily, let me ask you, if a teacher were to have a gun, mm -hmm. how do you think that would have changed the situation? I think that the amount of training that you would need in order to actually be able to safely handle a gun is, first of all, training that it's unrealistic to think we could efficiently uh, carry out with every single teacher. But also, I don't trust civilians to have guns if they haven't had the proper training and licensure. And I think that that doesn't change if they're a dangerous person or a teacher. Well, I want to stop you there, and I want you two to watch a film. We made a film with Nicole Hockley. She lost her six-year-old son, Dylan, who's a victim of the Sandy Hook school shooting in Connecticut back in 2012. It was a massacre that shocked the world and drew tears from then-President Barack Obama. Twenty young children and six adults were killed, and many people thought it was actually a turning point that people would finally address to begin the issue of gun violence in the United States. But six years on, and despite many campaigns and sadly many more attacks, legislation hasn't changed. Nicole is part of a group called Sandy Hook Promise, and they've decided to take a different approach to deal with the problem. Let's hear from her. You're okay, Dee. Dylan was absolutely the core of our family, and I think in part that was because he was the youngest of our two children, and in part because he was autistic. And he was always clinging to me like a, like a koala bear cuddled in my arms, or holding my hand, or pressing up against me if we sat together. He really liked um, being close. 
and, and that, those are nice memories to have. That Friday morning was uh, a very uh, normal morning, getting the boys up, getting them off to school, being told officially that Dylan had, was one of the ones that was killed uh, early that next morning. Um, that still didn't feel real. He was shot five times, four to the torso and one to the back of the head. Um, so his face was intact. So we were able to see him and I was able to hold his hand. Um, and I thought at that moment I'd realize that he was dead, but it still, you just can't. I don't think it's something that a parent can ever truly accept. I think the issue of gun violence prevention in the U.S has been always led by policy. And at the end of the day, you're not actually dealing with the core issue of how are we behaving about this issue? What are we doing to look out for each other? What are we doing before it gets to the point of no return? Um, and that's where this movement has been failing. And that's why for three decades, it hasn't really had a lot of progress. We launched Sandy Hook Promise one month after the tragedy, we're now officially six years old. Not everyone understood what we were up to, um, but it's proving to work now. It, it's saving lives and it's making a difference. The reason that we have not focused on legislation as our primary activity is because when you look at social change in our country, change doesn't come from policy. It comes through grassroots effort, it comes through education, it comes from programs. But we're trying to change a culture here and that takes time. Dang, bro, I'm so late. Yeah, I'm late to class. The point of view is, um, is this story that you don't quite realize what you're watching at the start. It feels like just another typical day at high school and there's an election coming up. That's kind of the backstory. And as we're following this kid, but you're seeing people ignore this person, not giving him a leaflet um, at the start of the school day. And he's sitting by himself in the cafeteria. No one's sitting with him. And when one, one of the candidates is walking by, she kind of looks at him and then looks on and, and gives her leaflet to someone else. The bullying that goes on as the student's walking outside, it's, it's all these subtle signs that are building up over time. And you don't even know what's gone on in this kid's life outside of school to lead him to this point. You don't realize until the end, of course, that you are, you're seeing through the eyes of the would-be shooter. And that's the point of view that you have to the moment that he's actually entering the, uh, the auditorium and preparing to um, take out his act of, of violence or vengeance or whatever it is that he's feeling at that moment. Look at me! The whole message of all of our PSAs are always that signs and signals are there and you can prevent violence and gun violence if you know how to recognize the signs and then get help. I'm hopeful that I can put Sandy Hook Promise out of business because we wouldn't need to exist anymore. Um, but I think we've still got a long pathway ahead of us. All right, let's pick up and get some reaction from Emily and Samantha. Samantha, let me start with you. Um, you said that you want legislative change. The mother of Dylan in this film, she says that you can't get change, social change, uh, through legislation. It has to happen through grassroots movements. Mm -hmm. I think that it definitely is two-sided. There is a lot that has to do with legislation and there's a lot that has to do with culture. And they're trying to spark a culture shift, which I believe is important and admirable, but I think it also shifts the blame from what has allowed the situation to happen, the conditions that we live under, to the victims in a sense. You just recently graduated from high school, you're in college now. Did you see a lot of um, students that were under these conditions when you were in high school? I think that when you see people uh, discussing a school shooting after it happens, a lot of them say, we never thought it would happen here. And to an extent, that's true. But after you hear enough people say it, as a high school student, you start to think, yeah, I, it could happen here. You realize that, that you start to imagine it happening at your school. If it happened to them, it could happen to you. You know, a couple of years ago, I might have said, I think we're really on the brink of change. But after Sandy Hook, after all of these shootings have happened, 
it's hard for me at this point to believe that change is going to come soon. Is this going to be a major issue for you in the upcoming 2020 elections? Absolutely, absolutely. Um, I was just below the cutoff for voting in 2016, and I think that that's a big part of this debate is that students are often not of age to vote for themselves and to have their say in the government. Uh, it's definitely going to be a big factor in who I'm voting for in 2020. You, Samantha? Definitely can say the same. All right. Emily, Samantha, thank you very much for coming on The Square thank and you. sharing your experiences. Thanks. Well, that's it for now. If you'd like to join in the discussion on any of the topics on this episode, you can go to our Facebook and Twitter sites at TR2 World. Thank you for joining us here on The Square. Hope to see you next time. Until then, it's goodbye from New York.